Hi there, this is Gary Hoover from Austin, Texas, saying hello to the Spark Summit in Singapore, and to my great friend, the amazing James Norris, for putting all this together. I hope you all have a great weekend and learn a a lot of cool stuff and all that jazz. Uh, behind me is on the sides a bunch of information about my new company, Big Wig Games. It's my fifth startup. You can go to my YouTube channel and find out more about it. But I, I wanted to leave that up. I'm going to need that for some other things here in my little studio. What I want to talk about today, as James can tell you, I'm an ardent believer in lifelong learning. I believe that the core value for great entrepreneurs is curiosity. Well, I'd, I'd probably rank it right up there with passion. If you're curious and you're passionate and you want to do something to serve other people, then you have the potential to become an entrepreneur, whether it's in the for-profit world, the non-profit world, in government, um, libraries, universities, museums, any type of enterprise. And so I want to touch real briefly today on how we learn. Because what I see when I teach classes and, and work with a lot of people, I mentor hundreds or thousands of entrepreneurs all over the world. I've been to 45 countries. What I, I find out is a lot of people haven't really learned how to learn and to learn ambitiously, uh, uh, to have high goals for their learning. So I've broken it down into five ways that we learn. The first one on my list is study. Now think of that for a second as being something passive that, um, oh, like you read a book, uh, you're looking at Wikipedia, you're watching a documentary on television, uh, uh, you're, you're listening to this right now and you don't have a chance to ask me questions, argue with me, you know? So you're kind of taking it in, it's not a two-directional thing. That's a really important part of the way we learn and it includes the classroom. One of the problems, at least in the United States we have, is people confuse education with the classroom. Uh, I used to be on the board of directors of a company called Whole Foods Market. Uh, when I met the man who started that, they did $10 million US a year in revenue. Last year they did almost 12 billion. They've gone, since I've known them, from one store to over 300. And people say, well, where did he get his MBA or whatever? And I say, no, he's self-educated. He's a college dropout, unlike, uh, just like uh, um, uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and uh, Michael Dell and Larry Ellison Oracle. So it's not that unusual. But the thing is, I say, well, John was self-educated. Well, the reality is we are all self-educated. I know people that have two or three PhDs who, are, who know nothing, who cannot finish a dinner conversation. On the other hand, I know people who are high school dropouts who are incredibly well educated. Education is a lifelong thing. Most really well educated people learn less than 5% of what they know in the classroom. Now, I wouldn't take my time to teach classes if I didn't think it was important, if I didn't think it worked. And depending on where you are in your life, what you're trying to learn, what the subject is, what style of learner you are, the classroom might be the right place for it. So I don't, I'm not taking it off the list, but understand it's just a part of things. But all this stuff called study, and the other thing I would say is it shouldn't be passive. You should be in your head arguing with me right now or making notes. I believe in writing everything down. No matter how smart you are, all your great ideas are going to flow right through your fingers and everything you hear and see is going to go right through your fingers if you don't write it down. Here I have 235 business ideas in these little tablets. This is tablet number 220. I kept a, started keeping a list 50 years ago when I was 12 years old, but I've been using this system about 14 years. Richard Branson, the great entrepreneur, has over 3,000 tablets, all numbered and kept in order. And you don't usually have to look back at the stuff you write down because the process of writing it down carves it in your head. So study is important. But the way most people learn most of what they know is through conversation, talking to others. And if I were to make a point about that, I'd say we have a tendency to talk to the rich, the powerful, the successful, whatever, and that's great. Go ahead and keep doing that. But my rule is there's no one on earth that I can't learn something from. If I sit next to you on a long airplane flight and you think you're going to read a novel, you got another thing coming because I got questions for you. Where are you coming from? Where are you headed? What do you do? What can I learn about you and your business? And, and there's nobody we can't learn something from. The workers, the, the bosses, uh, the old people, the young people, people from all over the world. Uh, and so the idea of conversing with everybody and talking and 
And as Sam Walton, the great American retailer, said uh, the idea was he would suck people's brains dry. He would know more about them than they knew about themselves at the end of a conversation because he was so intensely curious about people. And let's face it, enterprises are about people. They're not about accounting. They're not about a mar marketing. They're uh, not about information management. They're not about technology. All those things are cool. All those things are important. I love all of them. But the essence of entrepreneurship and leadership is people, is psychology, is sociology, how to motivate people, how to convince people, how to work with people, how to deal with people having issues with each other. So getting along with people, understanding people is the guts of this whole thing. Third way we learn, they don't teach it in school very much, observation. Most of what you need to know is right in front of you. The average room that I speak in, I make speeches all over the world, there's, there's dozens of $100 million business opportunities, and the people sitting in that room never see them. They're reaching for some, oh, I'm going to create the next Facebook or whatever, and they don't notice. They tripped over the carpet because they haven't figured out how to keep carpets down. The chair wobbles. They haven't figured out how to make a system that keeps chairs and tables from wobbling. Um, you can go into, at least in the United States, but I, I bet you it's true, in Singapore as well, one of my favorite cities. I, I've been there a few times. I love Singapore. Um, you can go in the U.S. to any well-run supermarket, and even if it was closed, go in there for 30 minutes, come out, and you should be able to tell me the average age, the average income, the ethnicity, and the family size of the people that shop that store. Because that information is all right there. When I go down Orchard Road and I go to the beautiful shopping malls, I learn so much about Singapore by just watching the people and how they're spending and what they buy and what they're interested in and everything. Um, so keep your eyes open. Most people with, with the cell phones and with all the gadgets, most people go through their lives with their eyes closed and their ears closed. Those are not going to be the kind of people that innovate, that make a real difference in the world. My fourth thing, experimentation, trial and error, uh, uh, experience, you could call it. Um, there's a lot of things in entrepreneurship that are especially need experimentation. In my experience, pricing. When you're trying to price something, I don't care if it's a seminar, a summit, a workshop, a new product, a piece of software software, an automobile, it's really hard to know how to price it. And all you can do is kind of take a stab at it and see how it works and then begin to adjust from there. It's a matter of let's try this, let's try that. And even pricing models. Is it a subscription model? Is it a pay-per-view model? You know, there's so many different ways that you can price things. Is it free but advertising sponsored like a lot of the media? So experimentation. The fourth thing, the thing that people forget the most often is I put cogitation, meditation, whatever, thinking. Because if you get in the habit of doing these four things and you do them all the time, then you stop and you think about it. Needless to say, I'm in my house. Needless to say, my house had a lot of whiteboards. Uh, I, I stop and I tell you if, you, if you do those other four things, and they're just habits, it's just a matter of getting in the habit of doing them. You do those four things and then um, you stop and you shut yourself in a room or, or go for a long walk in the park or whatever works for you, go for a swim, and you just think about what you've learned. So no other people, no teams, no communication, no email, no telephone, just think about what you've learned. I think visually, I draw a lot of charts and things like this, you know, whatever works for you, process everything you've taken in by these other four methods. And, and if you shut yourself in a room for two hours and do that, you will be smarter at the end of those two hours than you were at the beginning of the two hours. Just by yourself. No teachers, no books, no nothing. But you do have to do all these other things or else you're kind of wasting the two hours. You've got to have the ingredients to which to make the stew with. I added, I used to have it as a separate category at one point, travel. Travel is just the most wonderful thing. Like I said, I'm in the 45 countries. I want to see them all. I'm working on it. Haven't quite made it. And, and James and I have done some very interesting traveling together. And, and travel, when you travel, you do all those things. And, and I remember, I actually, I wrote a book. And you know, I talk about observations I made hanging out in Singapore about the people and what I saw. So it's been suggested to me that I should give you an assignment, something, a, a challenge for you. Uh, I was trying to come up with something I thought would be interesting and creative, and, and one of the things I observe here in the United States, uh, people in the United States don't have a good understanding of Mexico. Mexico, of course, is a lower income country than the United States. It's our, our neighbor. I believe we share the longest border on Earth. Well, Canada's going to be a little longer border. We have a big border with them. We have one of the big borders. and and and. Uh, and, and a lot of people in the United States are from Mexico. We have all these connections. And yet, 
the average American business person or social entrepreneur I meet thinks, oh, Mexico, it's poor, it's dirty, it's corrupt, it's violent, um, and, and some of those things are true. They're probably all true to one degree or another. But I see a different Mexico. I've traveled down there. I took a 22-hour bus ride from Austin, Texas, where I live, down there, uh, to Mexico City, one of the world's greatest cities in my book, most amazing, more museums than any city on Earth. Um, and I see a different Mexico. I see, when I look at the data, when I study the economics, I see a country that doesn't have an aging baby boom that's going to take a lot of government benefits out of the system like we have in the United States. It's a real problem for the United States over the next 30, 40 years. Mexico is a young nation. Uh, the vast majority of people are of working age. Their education levels are going up and up. They have a booming middle class. Last year, Mexico was the fourth biggest exporter of automobiles in the world, right behind South Korea. A few years ago, it was ninth. I see, I, I, I'm not trying to see Mexico six months from now uh, or nine months from now. I'm trying to see Mexico five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now because that's the Mexico I need to understand if I'm going to be a successful entrepreneur, especially if I see those opportunities which are enormous for doing business with Mexico. And that's why I spent a lot of time there and I study it. I give a lot of talks in the United States. But it's a situation where the news kind of says one thing, you've got to go deeper. You've got to work harder at it to see the opportunity. Uh, you know, the news, they want to play up, you know, violence and terrible things that happen to people or, you know, and, and, but these, the things that really matter, they're not news, they're long-term trends. If you study geology and all that, you learn about plate tectonics, the underlying stuff. I mean, when a tsunami hits, it's too late for an entrepreneur to do too much about it. But if you study the plate tectonics and you can see it coming, if that were possible, you'd be ahead of the game. Well, demographics and basic economic structures and infrastructure, that's the plate tectonics of, of industry, of business. And, and so I do a lot of work trying to say, oh, study Mexico and learn. And the thing is, I'm not alone. There are many U.S. companies that are really investing huge amounts of money in Mexico, including Walmart, including United Airlines, and, and, and are really betting on the future of that country. So I'm not alone, but it ha you have to have a vision. You have to have sight down the road. So here's my challenge to you. Over the next, uh, I think, 30 days, I want you to do a study of Indonesia. I've been there several times. I collect Indonesian musical instruments. I love the country. I can look, if I were in Singapore, I might look at it much like Americans look at Mexico. I might look at it and say, it's poor, it's dirty, it's troubled, it's violent, it's corrupt, whatever, you know. Indonesia is a country of the future. All this attention is focused on China and India because of their massive size, and they deserve that attention. But a lot of the people who are really going to prosper and find exciting opportunities will be looking at the next rung down. It's just like I study South America a lot and a lot of focus on Brazil. But man, go visit Colombia. Awesome. Earth shattering. What that economy, what those people are going to do the next 50 years is going to blow people away. You can sense it in the air. Indonesia has been through its ups and downs. I've studied its history. What I'd like you to do is to go as deep as you can. I mean, look at data, look at The Economist magazine, uh, Far Eastern Economic Review, whatever. Go over to Select Books, one of my favorite bookstores in the world. It's there in, in Singapore. It's the, the best bookstore about Asia books on earth, uh, at least in the English language. Uh, and I go there as the first place I go when I get to Singapore. I love that store. Go over there and at least look through their books that they carry on Indonesia so you know what the key books are and then either buy them, I encourage that, but if your budget's tight, go down to the library and look at them. Or, or maybe there's a Kindle version or whatever. But that's a great way to start to see because books are still a very important part of the way we learn and not every book is available in digital or Kindle form or whatever, or iPad form, you know. So I, I would challenge you to do that and write up a report, you know. If you write up a report about Indonesia and email it to me, I'm not hard to find on the internet, but it's Gary Hoove at msn.com. I'll try to take a look at it. I'll look at as many as I can. I mean, if I get thousands, maybe I'll get behind. But if I don't get too many, I'll look at them and write up a report and talk about wh what's Indonesia going to look like in 10 years and 20 years. Where are the opportunities? Because, because the thing is, you have that massive population base. That's what gets me excited. You have a country with a lot of natural resources, uh, uh, plenty of water, you know, ought to have a lot of fish and everything. But we also know there's a lot of minerals and all sorts of stuff. It's so huge, you know. It's further across in the United States, I think, or same width, at least. It's, it's a monster country, but it's an island nation. And where are the opportunities? How is it going to 
change. I think for years people have understood uh, uh, regional airlines have a great future in Indonesia. Now the airline business is a tough business, but um, you know they ain't going to be running high-speed trains between all those islands. You know, maybe helicopters or something. I don't know. Think about the people, how they're going to evolve because they, you know, they have a much more democratic society. There have been a lot of advancements over the last 10 or 20 years I've really been studying Indonesia. So, so look at it and, and see if you can come up with a perspective that might be different from what your average friends in Singapore think of Indonesia. And I don't know what they think, I'm just guessing. Um, but, uh, but so few people understand that country. It's so big, it's so complex, it has multiple religions, it has different kinds of tensions, all the different islands have their you know, different house styles, architecture and all that. It's a wonderful, wonderful country to study, one of the most interesting ones on earth. Um, so I'd urge you to like do your own study and, and try to think where might be opportunities there because when you've got that many people, man, a small opportunity can be big. Guys, I think that's all I wanted to say today. I hope it's helpful. And again, I, I really appreciate your taking the time to listen to me. I hope you have a wonderful time. I can't wait to get back to Singapore. James, find me a speaking gig so I can come over there and, and say hello in person. Uh, that's a lot more fun than, you know, talking to a camera here. Anyway, Gary Hoover, Austin, Texas. Have a great weekend. And give yourself some spark. Bye-bye.